Welcome to another physics video. This is part one of a series of videos which will go through how to analyze data in physics, particularly using the software program Excel. We are hoping that you are familiar with some of the terms that we'll be using in data analysis. If you can't remember them or you want to be re-familiarize yourself with them, please go to my classes and have a look at the relevant module. For this particular video, we are going to be looking at an object that is falling vertically straight down due to gravity. I have a sample size of seven because I've collected the data over seven different times and I've located the object using video analysis. We completed five trials for this particular experiment. I want to point out here that by doing five trials, we have sort of kind of gone over the minimum required amount. Um, in physics class, you should have discussed what is the minimum number of trials that are required. And hopefully your class discussed that perhaps three is enough. Um, I would like to suggest that when you're doing an experiment, absolutely, if you have three trials that match really well, um, then yes, that would be enough. Unfortunately, when you're practically doing an experiment, if you only do three trials, if one or two of them are really far away or something's gone wrong, you would have to ditch those data. And so then you would be only left with one or only two trials, which then is insufficient. So it is wise to do more trials at time permitting. So five seems to be a fairly good, good number because that means that I can probably ditch two of the trials and still have three that are really good. So let's get started. To begin, um, I want to highlight and talk about um, these values here, uh, particularly the values that are at the top of the data table. I'm going to just highlight them so you can see what I'm talking about. And they would be for the time and for the displacement. These are absolute measurement uncertainties. They were obtained using a really careful consideration of our measuring device. So the 0.2 seconds come from our assumption of a human using a stopwatch measuring the time. So therefore, our human reaction time is about 0.2, which is why I'm a bit uncertain by 0.2. The displacement value of 0.1 meter, which is at 10 centimeters, might seem at first glance quite large because in class we've talked about the fact that absolute measurement uncertainty, particularly for a ruler, should be half the limit of reading. However, we are not using a ruler here because it is incredibly difficult to measure something that is moving. So as I mentioned before, we should use video analysis. So that means that I filmed the object falling and then I used video analysis to try to measure the distance that was traveled. So my understanding of the data analysis, analysis software is that there is a slight discrepancy of around 10 centimeters. It is better to err on the side of caution than to underestimate the size of the absolute measurement uncertainty. Now that we've covered that, let's have a look at how to calculate the mean for the displacement because I've got five trials and then to calculate the absolute uncertainty of the mean. To do this, we can use the equation function in Excel. To access the equation function, choose the box where you would like to do the calculation in, type in the equal sign, and to get Excel to calculate an, a mean value, we're going to use the function average. Uh, typing in average uh, pulls up these function uh, options, and I love Excel because it actually gives you a little outline of what, uh, what this particular function will do. So if you just stay here and you can read the line that says that it returns the average arithmetic mean of its arguments, which can be numbers, names, arrays, or reference that contains numbers. So for us, it's going to be easy. It's going to be numbers. So we're going to open bracket and we're going to then choose the range of values that we would like Excel to average. So it is only this first row that I want to do it for. Um, so that's the five trials for when time is one seconds. Um, hold down the left click button, drag across, and then release and then close the bracket and then press enter. And there you go, that is your average value for that particular um, time. To then fill the rest of the column, uh, you can of course uh, then proceed to redo all of those equations, but there is no need because Excel is pretty smart. That's why we've done this in a spreadsheet so that it can make your life easier. So if you move your mouse to the bottom right hand corner here, um, it actually turns into a little cross. If you now double click on the left button, 
uh, of your mouse, it will auto fill down. Now this process will work um, if you've got a clean data table like mine where there's no extra data down the bottom um, and Excel knows that your data table needs to finish at that particular point. At this point, I'd also like to go through how to actually do proper table headings um, for each and every column. So in the notes, we've already talked about the fact that column headings need to have both the name of the quantity, the symbol and the units. So what I've done is I've actually pre-filled some of this already and I'm assuming that you know how to do this. So I'm just going to make them visible to you. So I've got mean displacement and also the absolute uncertainty of the mean. I'm going to show you a few things. Um, First of all, most students will ask, how come I did not use the S with the bar over the top to denote mean displacement? Um, the ability to put the little bar over the top of the symbol is actually pretty hard to do in Excel because it doesn't allow you to use the insert equation function. However, if you're copying the starter table and pasting it back into a Word document for a report, uh, you can by all means use the insert equation formula there and you can then actually get the proper symbol for mean displacement. But just for now, because I'm in Excel and I want to make sure I denote the right things, I actually want to get the word mean to display as um, a subscript. So the way to do this is to highlight the word mean um, and then go up to the font option up here. Um, you can choose to go up here or you can press Control Shift F um, as a shortcut key. It opens like this and what you want to choose is you want to choose this option, the subscript option. And then if you press OK, it would turn that into a subscript. Now, I've already done that for the absolute uncertainty of the mean of the displacement. Um, I've finished everything except um, I've got this giant uh, capital D here, which is actually not what I want. I actually want this to be delta S mean. Um, and to get this to be a delta symbol, I can insert symbol. But the fastest way to do this is to use capital D, go up to the fonts. Um, instead of using Calibri, um, I'm going to type in uh, the option symbol and it actually automatically turns it into a delta symbol. So this is the fastest way to do it. Now for the absolute uncertainty of the mean. Uh, for those of you that have forgotten uh, the equation for how to calculate absolute uncertainty of the mean, please do go back and look at the module on my classes. Uh, the equation is going to pop up down here in the orange box for you in a moment. And if you look, you'll notice that we need to have a maximum value out of our trial. Okay, I'm just going to highlight the trial for one second. Um, and also the minimum value, subtract them and then divide by two. Now, obviously, you can determine the largest and the smallest value visually, but since we've gone through the effort of putting into a spreadsheet, it would be really great if Excel can do this, and it can. So all you need to do, I'm going to show you how to find the maximum value first and the minimum, and then we're going to put them all together. So type in the equal sign, type in the word max, and that returns the largest value. And all you need to do is open a bracket and tell Excel now where to look. So I'm going to get it to look only for the one second sample size and across the five trials. Hold down the left click button, drag all across, release, close the bracket and then press enter. And you'll now see that it's returned um, a maximum value. So that's the biggest value that I've got here. Uh, if I also want the smallest value, I would go minimum, um, open brackets, and I would also select the range of values here, close bracket, and I would return the smallest value. And you can see that. Um, I've tidied up the values so that they are only to one decimal place, but here in this particular setting, they're returning huge number of decimal places. That's why it looks a bit um, random with extra digits. So I can tidy this up now um, by making sure that they're um, returning a more sensible number of significant figures. Now that I've got that sorted, um, I've got maximum and minimum. Uh, values, uh, but I need to put it into a formula. So let's do that. I'm going to get rid of these two. Uh, I'll type in the equal. Um, I want it to return the maximum value of this particular data set minus the minimum value um, over the same data set. So highlight the same section, hold down the left click button and release close. And then I want to divide by two. Now, if you just type this, um, Excel actually uh, follows BOMDAS. So it does the order of operations. So it's just going to divide the minimum value by two. And it's not going to know that you actually want to do the subtraction first. So to force this to happen, um, I'm going to put in a bracket around the subtraction terms uh, so that the subtraction can take place first. 
um, and then divide by two. So if I press enter now, it will now return an absolute uncertainty of the mean for that particular um, sample. I'm going to fill down for all seven of my sample, uh, seven sample sizes and double click, same thing as we did in the previous column. Once we've done this, you hopefully will see that there is one value that is like gigantically large. So I'm highlighting that in orange so you can see it. It's 14.6, which is huge um, compared to everything else. This should ring slight alarm bells and you should now be looking at your data table to see if there was a particular value or maybe two that might have really skewed your results. So if you now have a look at the 2.5 seconds, you should see that, wow, it's this middle value, the um, 57.9. Uh, that's gigantically large. Um, and in physics, we like to call this an outlier. The QCAA hasn't got a strict definition of what an outlier is and how to define one. So here in this video and in the score, we're just going to try to use a mathematical term called a standard deviation. Um, it really describes the spread of the data. So I'm going to use um, Excel to calculate the standard deviation. One way to do that um, is to, I'm just going to write in um, standard deviation first. And I'm going to now get it to calculate this. So the standard deviation of that particular um, data set, you have to type in STD. There's different types of standard deviation that you can calculate, but I'm going to use stdev.p, the first one. Um, given that I've only got five sample sizes, um, uh, the trials, um, and I'm going to use all of them to calculate um, my standard deviation. Close the bracket. Um, and so the standard deviation is about 10.8. Um, we're going to define an outlier as a number that lies more than one standard deviation away from the mean. So I'm going to calculate what is one standard deviation away from the mean. Um, in this case, then, um, I'm going to do the calculation over here. How would I know what it would be? Um, I'm going to simply add my standard deviation. So I'm going to use the left click button to select the box. I'm going to go equal click the box plus the mean that I calculated up here in column G. Uh, press enter and you can see that one standard deviation away from the mean is 47.3. So 47.3 compared to 57.9. Uh, 57.9 is huge. It's far, far away. So we can now safely say that 57.9 is an outlier because it is one standard deviation away. So if you're writing this in the report, you should be highlighting your outliers because it is not a good idea in your data analysis to include an outlier. But it's also really important that you actually justify why you've chosen them to be an outlier. So for me, underneath this data table, if I was writing a report, there'll be a little sentence that says that uh, values highlighted above in the table in orange are outliers. They are more than one standard deviation away from the mean. If I've now established that that is a particular outlier, I will have to eliminate it from my calculation of the mean and also the absolute uncertainty of the mean. So if I go back to the value 36.4, um, 36.4 was me looking at an average over that whole set of values. I now want to edit this, so I'm going to go in and delete this. Um, and I want to tell it that I just want to use trial 1, 2 as well as trial 3, 4. Now, if you just use a left click button and try to highlight these. It just switches between the two. So what you'll need to do is you need to go, I want this, this set, trial one, two, and place in a comma. And then you want to go trial three, four. So I'm highlighting that again. Love Excel as well because it's color coded. Um, and it also has that little flashy dotted line to show you when you have selected a particular range of data. So if you press enter, that's now going to give you a new value for your mean that excludes the outlier. Now, if you're a bit concerned about that little um, green triangle that's popped up on the top uh, left-hand corner of that particular cell, that's just a warning message that Excel comes up with to say, hey, um, formula looks a bit inconsistent. This whole column does something different. This row is a bit weird. Do you need to check it out? Um, and you should not be worried because you have an outlier. So, um, And that's okay, and you've taken care of it. So I'm just going to click ignore the error so it goes away. Uh, but for the absolute uncertainty of the mean, I'm going to have to do the same thing. I'm going to have to try to get it to not look at all of the data. I'm going to have to exclude um, that particular outlier value. So I'm just going to get rid of the highlighting. 
first and then now go in to edit the range of values that this particular um, max uh, value is looking for. Same thing, um, highlight trial one, two, put in a comma, highlight trial three, four, and then also for the minimum value, um, you want to do the same thing. You want to go highlight trial one, two, comma, highlight trial three, four. And when you press enter, it will now return a particular new absolute uncertainty of the mean, which does not include your outlier. At this point, we should also discuss how to actually adjust the column, um, especially for the absolute uncertainties, to only display values of one significant figure. So here I've got um, 0.3 and 0.7. They're actually already in one significant figure form. But from here on down, at 1.3 down to 4.3, they are actually two significant figure numbers. So there's a button up here in um, the number section in the tab, uh, and it says decrease decimal place. We're going to do that now. If you do that, now that will drop down to what we call one significant figure. It is always important to note that just because it displays one significant figure, it doesn't mean that it is. Um, you can always increase the significant figures again so you can see all of the significant figures that went into that particular value. And if you are doing calculations in a spreadsheet like this, just by referring to the cell, it is always going to use all of the available uh, values as opposed to just the one significant figure value, which is always good because you only want to round at the very, very end.